All right. Now, those with surplus are expected to share that surplus. They're expected to play the role of a patron. That's what father means when Jesus calls God father. He means the God father. Jesus condemns surplus to satisfy personal interests. In fact, if such a person is greedy, to, I mean, such a person is greedy. If a person who gathers surplus and doesn't share like a patron, a patron, the person is greedy. And, and it's very possible, often possible in the Bible, whenever you see the word rich person, just take out rich and put in greedy. Like the man who stored his surplus into a barn. This was a wicked man, right? American look at that story and go, how is the man wicked? I'm doing that with my, you know, my investments. By the way, all of which the biblical people, Jesus, pre paschal Jesus, and Aristotle in the Mediterranean would say that's a contrary to nature, what you're doing with the money. Money's not supposed to do that. Money's not supposed to make money with money. Think about that when you talk about your annuity or your IRA. The rate of return in the parable is truly astonishing, isn't it? In its edited version found in Matthew, the two slaves each gain 100%, and in the Lucan edited version, one gains 500%, and another 1,000%. Roman sources relevant to the first century indicate that the legal interest rate was 12%. The gains reported by Luke are therefore quite likely exaggerated and would evoke gasps and vocal protests from any first century Mediterranean audience, including elites. Interpreting the parable. The interpretation of the parable hinges on the perspective of the storyteller. That's basically it. If the storyteller is Matthew or Luke, stage three, well that's one thing. If the storyteller is the pre paschal Jesus, that's quite another. Let's focus on Jesus, stage one. Did Jesus, stage one, tell this parable from the perspective of the rich, the master and the servants who acted dishonorably by colluding with the master in stealing from others? Was that the perspective Jesus told the story in stage one? Or did the pre paschal Galilean peasant day laborer turned folk healer Jesus tell this story from the perspective of the last servant who while presumably disobeying his master nevertheless acted honorably by preserving that trust. The master is described in Matthew as a hard man, harsh, cruel, and merciless. The Greek works for all three. In Luke, he is described as a severe man, meaning strict and exacting. And in fact, in the story, the man admits this. He admits to being someone who reaps where he has not labored and gathered where he has not labored or taking up what he did not labor to, lay down, and reaping what he has not sowed. So he's greedy to the core, isn't he? He's a thief. Could Jesus have possibly thought of this man in his original story as an analog for God, the God of Israel? He's the exact opposite of the ideal rich man praised by Ben Sira. Sirach chapter 8, verse 2. Happy or honorable the rich man found without fault, who turns not aside after gain. Who turns not aside after gain. Who does not neglect his obligation to help those who cannot help themselves, Americans. In contrast, the third servant does the honorable thing by not seeking to augment the money entrusted to him. In Matthew, the servant buries it, 
which is what the Mishnah recommends. Such a person would not be responsible for the loss of an entrusted amount. If you forget where it's buried, that's how it was understood. Well, it was lost, but Shalah, God willed it. More risky would be what Luke tells what the, the man did, to wrap it in a cloth. The Mishnah identifies that as the riskier choice. In either case, the third servant refuses to participate in his greedy master scheme to take money from others, interest, to which he has no right. Western interpreters, generally speaking, view the third servant as a failure. He played it safe instead of taking a risk, we tend to think. Oh, 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 oh,